This rather complicated diagram illustrates the PIC32 architecture. Up here at the top, it's getting cut off a little bit, is the timing generation circuit, which takes in a clock signal from some external crystal oscillator. And from that generates three other clock signals. One is called the USB clock, and that's what's used to time the USB communication on the PIC. The other one is called a system clock, or sys clock, and that's what's used to clock the CPU. We're going to run it at 80 megahertz. And then the last one is the PB clock, or peripheral bus clock, and that's what's used to clock a number of the peripherals on the PIC32. We're also going to clock the peripheral bus at 80 megahertz. So let's start over here with the CPU. So the CPU is actually licensed by microchip from another company. It's called the MIPS32 M4K CPU. And this CPU talks to the data RAM down here if it wants to read and write data through what's called the bus matrix. Okay. It also communicates with program flash because it has to fetch instructions from program memory. And the program flash is down here. And the program flash is actually slower than the data RAM. It takes longer to read something from flash than it takes to read from RAM. So because of that, they also put in this prefetch cache module. And what that actually does is it tries to run ahead of the program, go a few steps ahead, and try to fetch over instructions before they're needed by the CPU. So now when the CPU asks, asks for the next program instruction, it checks to see if it's already sitting there in cache. And if so, it can get it immediately. Otherwise, if it's not there, it has to wait a couple of extra clock cycles for it to come in from flash memory. Okay. So that's the CPU, data RAM, and program flash. You can see over here on these ports, port A down to port G. Those are our digital input and output ports. Each one of those ports consists of a number of pins, each of which can act as a digital output or a digital input. And the values that are coming in are communicated to the CPU over this peripheral bus here that's clocked by the system clock. So it's running on the same clock that the microprocessor is. And those values come down to the peripheral bridge here and get put up on the bus matrix, so then they, they're accessed by the CPU. And the same thing if values are written out to digital outputs, they come down here through the bus matrix, through the peripheral bridge, and out to the digital outputs. Now, in addition to these digital input and outputs, there's a number of other peripherals on the PIC32 that are actually clocked by the peripheral bus clock. That clock could run at a lower rate than the system clock, but in our use of it, we're going to keep it at the same rate, 80 megahertz. And if you go right down here, you can see all these peripherals that are available to the PIC32. Uh, these first ones here are called change notification pins. These are inputs that are monitoring perhaps some sensor in the world. And if there's any change in the voltage, say from low to high, then that's going to trigger one of these change notification pins, and it can generate an interrupt. Interrupts are a critical part of embedded real-time control. We'll learn more about them later. But basically what they do is they tell the CPU, stop whatever you're doing, attend to some new task, because I recognize that something has changed in the outside world. And when you finish taking care of that task, then you can go back to what you were doing before. So the change notification pins look for any change in the outside world, and then they generate an interrupt if one happens. We've got timer one to five here, and each of these can count up from zero to two to the 16 minus one. We can also take pairs of them and put them together and make a 32-bit timer out of them. So those can be used for counting or for timing operations. We've got five pulse width modulation output channels here, or output compares. Those generate digital pulse trains that we use to drive motors. Uh, we also have input capture, and these are used to, to do precise timing. If we have a digital signal coming in going from low to high, we can use that to precisely time how long the signal was low or how long it was high. We have four SPI communication channels. This is a very popular communication protocol for microcontrollers. We've got five I2C communication channels, a different protocol, also very popular for microcontrollers. The parallel master port, we won't talk much about that for now. 
we have these 10-bit analog to digital converters. So these are what we'll use to read sensors. They might be providing voltages back to the PIC in the range of 0 to 3.3 volts. And because it's 10 bits, we can distinguish 2 to the 10 different levels of voltage from 0 to 3.3. We've also got a number of UARTs available to us. And this is what we use to speak RS-232. And in fact, our PIC is going to be talking to our laptop using these UARTs. So we can write information back and forth from the laptop to the PIC. Uh, we also have a real-time clock and calendar. And this is a module that can keep track of time. Um, even when the CPU is sleeping, it can keep track of the time and day uh, for years. And finally, we have these things called comparators. And these are primarily used to check whether one voltage level is higher or lower than another voltage level. And then we can use, we can use that information in a number of different ways.